Well, so we don't have to speak to uh, regular um, guests for the studio um, as far as energy is concerned and we're speaking to Kujo Poku here he works with gas up oil and uh, he significantly also an energy aspect as far as uh, we're concerned we'll be joined by John Peter Mewu who is with the Africa Center for Energy Policy but um, importantly the Ministry of Energy and Petroleum has directed the VRA to seek external help to efficiently manage its thermal plants and we know that we're having extreme deficiencies in production of energy and uh, the question is how do we make sure as a country we think through and have substantially a medium to long-term mindset policy towards the subject of generation of power mm. so that's what we're talking about this morning we have in the studio uh, Poku, thanks for joining me. Hi, good morning. How are you? Gas up oil. What basically do you do? Um, Gas up oil is an upstream company. Um, we had one of the blocks um, upstream on the south of Mon Basin for exploration. Um, I use the word had because um, when we had our petroleum agreement, um, there has been little drawbacks, and we are still trying to rectify that. Mm. So, but we, we are in the upstream business. Mm. Now, uh, if significantly you take a critical look at. Um, thermal power generation. Okay. Would you say is a direction that the country needs to go? Um, yes, thermal is good. You see, um, as a country, uh, we need to have a mixture. Um, our energy mix should be balanced. I think for a very long time we had hydro being the major um, contribution to our energy mix, and um, the ongoing policy from the ministry seemed to show that they want to also boost their thermal side of it. Um, the only drawback with thermal is that um, it is powered by either gas or diesel or light crude. Um, it's shown that diesel and light crude are very expensive um, and there's the need to basically have the gas. That is why we had the West African gas pipeline which was going to bring gas which was being fled in Nigeria because you see the reason gas became a big deal was that when you are drilling for crude oil the byproduct, which is normally fled and basically into the air, was the natural gas, the gas that's associated with the crude oil being drilled. So the powers that be or the think tanks were like, okay, why not tap the gas that is being fled and then basically pipe it to our neighbors in West Africa? And that is how we came up with the West African gas pipeline. Now, with everything that people start to use, that means you increase demand, then obviously the price also goes up. Now, I think the gas is not coming as regularly as we have thought from Nigeria because the Nigerians also have their own energy needs and they are trying to use the same gas they would have otherwise sent to us, trying to also develop thermal plants in Nigeria to use it. So what happens is that we have now had to look at other options like the Ghana gas um, project going on in the western region. Um, the Ghana gas would give us some amount of gas, but that is only for the Tico plant. All the other thermal plants that are coming up, we need to also find out how are we going to get gas to supply to these. I heard the minister saying that Asogli is doing expansion. Mm. You know, how are they going to get enough thermal plant, uh, enough gas for these expansions and all the other um, gas um, thermal plants that are coming online? So thermal is the way to go, but we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket. Mm. We should also look at a mixture of other um, energy significant, uh, significant mm. yes. Maybe. Now, 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 as far as the having a mixture of the energy sources are concerned, do you think that as a country, even though we know what it should be, we have a plan or a strategy towards it? Um, I don't think we do have a plan. Um, you see, one of the problems we've had in Ghana in the past is continuity, okay? Um, policy continuity. Now, um, Honorable Boy is doing his best. You can see that he's very energetic, very visionary. He said, okay, look, let's do 5,000 by 2020 or 5,000 by 2016. That is good because he's showing that, look, this is my drive. Mm. But then what would be sad is that touch wood, be it he's reposted, there's a reshuffle, mm. or a new government comes in place. What happens to that vision? Is that same energy that Honorable has, is that going to be continued? Obviously not, because everybody also comes in with their new uh, energies and also have a new direction. I think what the country should have, and it would help us a lot, is to have a concrete plan, like you said, a vision. If we are saying that 5,000 by 2016, mm. that should be not 
honorable boy's agenda or honorable boy's drive it should be enshrined okay that okay as a country it is cast in stone that we want as to achieve policy. as a national policy that goes beyond the boundaries but of or political office. Or office or even not political individual office because you see the civil servant i always blame civil servants because i think they don't help their um, their cause in the sense that when a new minister comes in every civil servant wants to sit there and look at him and see mm. okay what did you bring mm. they don't push for what's already in existence in the ministry okay so yes if we want to have a direction and we are saying 5,000 um, megawatts by 2016. Yes, it, it sounds good. Is it, a is it attainable? Mm. That's a different conversation. But it's, it shows that somebody is giving leadership and mm. somebody is driving something. And when that is being done, what does it mean? It means that everybody is now going to work towards that. Mm. Well, well Kwejo, when you take a significant look at the energy sector, now, particularly when we're not even going to focus on, on exploration, upstream exploration, etc. Um, since we discovered oil, and almost as if it's, it's been almost... Uh, 2000, okay. 2005. 2005. By next year, we'll get to 10. So 2007, sorry, okay. 2007. Okay, 2007. Seven. 2007, okay. Uh, w w very soon, we'll get to the 10th year, the tenth a decade. Year. It's a safe, as a country... We, we seem to know what we want, but we don't know how to get there. Um, you see, we, we're probably one of the newest countries to f discover oil. Most of our neighbors, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, have had oil for so many years. Well, they've had, they, Nigeria have, have had, had significance oil, over the last of, four decades. Yes, it? and, and as, uh, I think we should have really not, I wouldn't say cut and paste, but we should have looked at the Nigerian model, what they got wrong, how they transitioned to get it right mm. in terms of um, indigenous participation, mm. okay, local content, and how it would benefit the country. We should have looked at it very well and made it suit, take it and make it suit us. I don't think we've done that extensively. You know, we're looking at local content um, debate. Look, there was a time when we were doing local content hearings or awareness or um, commission setting in the northern region. We were taking it from region to region to find out from people what a local content bill should be. Really, I mean, if you go to Upper East Region and you're asking them about local content in the oil and gas, what contribution would they make to it? Very vague contribution. Zero uh, 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 Exactly. So what we should have done, instead of doing internal, fine, is well to consult the average Ghanaian in what they want. But also what we should have done, instead of going around the 10 regions doing local content bill input, we should have looked at the various countries, what they had. 30 years ago, how they transition over the years, how the laws have changed, what informed the change in the laws, okay? And then how did they get to where they are now? Mm. Is this something that they've got it right? How can we improve it? That way, Ghana would have benefited because we wouldn't have invented the wheel. Mm. We would have basically based our experience on other people's failures. Mm. But we, I don't think we did that 100%. We did some, but I don't think we got that right. Mm. And that is why... Um, Though we know where we want to get to, we don't know how to get there. Mm. Because if you look at the problems that you, you, in various sectors of the oil and gas, um, salaries of um, oil workers, um, I read recently that is the most lowest in the industry in the whole world, the Ghanaian um, working in the oil and gas industry. Well, significantly, in, in Ghana, it is the high, one of the highest. Well, but it shouldn't be. You know, uh, an industry is an industry. Um, somebody who works Well, a banking in industry is a banking industry, but you can make a comparative analysis with what persists in countries like, even in Africa, South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, etc. Well, you can't, <laughs> but it Because the economy is in no, the relativity uh, You, you see, difference. let me give an example. Please do. If Tulo brings in a geologist from, let's say, London to work in Ghana, he's paid the same amount of money he would have otherwise been paid if he was in London. You mean we, the expert? We, we call him an expert, yes. Now, we have that in various facets okay. of our society. If that very Ghanaian, who is the same, has the same expertise, was sent also out, uh, let's say the GMPC or Talo, to another country in Africa, they would also have been treated as an expert. Yes. And yes, but my point is that the, the grading, the disparity should not be that high. Yes, let's assume that so you don't pay... So you're saying it should be equitable, could you? Uh, it should be proportional. Okay. Now, 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 there's always a talk 
or do you think that perhaps we seem to get the argument wrong when we think because we've discovered oil consumption or supply of the derivatives to the local population and ultimately how that should translate into um, supply for the thermal plants and, and, and electricity or power generation should be something that the Ghanaian should feel that should be easy. Yes, it, it, you see, it, that, should, it should have that, been. Yeah, it should have been. That's long term planning. Why do we have the inadequacy then? Okay, long term planning. Because I'll give it's an been almost uh, seven years. Seven years. I'll give an example. Okay, we discovered um, the discovery was made in somewhere May 2007, if I'm right. Mm, um, mm, mm, mm. I think it started from, they started getting. No, huge indications the, from the, 2005. The, yes, but the discovery itself, when the, uh, yes. yeah, the formal discovery, when the actual uh, what people call a jung, a jungle on plate mm. went to the castle. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. When they put it on the castle to show it to the president Kufo that oh, we've discovered oil. This is it, and they all sh show it. Everybody was excited. Somewhere around the early part of the first quarter 2007. Um, what you look at is that when you go forward from there. The, there was a three years gap or something like four years gap between discovery and production. Okay. Now you're asking, as a country, did we prepare enough? The crude oil is being shipped out. Tor is sitting there without crude oil. Okay. Now, if it was me, the minute we discovered oil, we would have found out what grade of crude oil is it? Is it something that could be refined in Tor? No. If it can't, what can we do at Tor in preparation for the crude oil? to be able to at least be refining tour. We had a four-year gap. So whatever finances you need, if it's a catalyst at all, if it's a machinery at all, whatever, that should have been put in place for tour to be able to receive some amount of the crude oil coming in into tour. We didn't do that. The production started, and the crude oil is being shipped out. And tour is sitting there without any, um, without any mm. crude oil. And we are still looking for crude oil for tour. So those are some of the things that I would say that it, it, it didn't if come If we were planning. doing all these, would they have made it easier to perhaps generate power better? And how would that have been achieved? Um, in t power, it's different because then you also look at, like I said to you, Nigeria had a lot of crude and flaring gas. Mm. We knew that when we start producing crude oil, we're going to flare gas. So the issue of tapping the gas for local industry mm. should have also started a bit earlier. Mm. So that same thing as in 2007, we should know that, okay, the minute crude oil starts, there's going to be flaring of gas. Ghana gas came on at the latter stage, the, the, the concept of Ghana gas, okay, so that we can tap the gas from the wells to Ghana gas so that for local industry. So like I'm saying, it's the planning. If we have planned a bit earlier, mm. we would have now gotten Ghana gas on stream earlier mm. so that we wouldn't have been flaring the gas for the past four, five, six, seven years. Mm. But there's, al there's also the arguments I've heard about, Kwejo, that is also because when we came, we needed, uh, because we had a change of government, we needed to take a real look at contractual issues and things and policy and whether it was in the right direction. So we had a bit of delay of a year or two. That also had significant uh, impact also. But we'll be discussing, especially now we have... Um, the supposed policy that we need to have a lot more entry of IPPs into the power producing um, sector. We have on the line John Peter Mew. Uh, he is um, the head of uh, policy and research at the Africa Center for Pol Energy Policy. Uh, Mr. Mew, a very good morning to you. Uh, good morning. And okay, good we're, morning. We're, you were supposed to join us in the studio, but we understand that you have an emergency, so you have to deal with it. Let's just, um, if you can join us for the next five minutes, we, we just do a tete a tete on this very uh, subject. And, and this is where we bring you in. The, 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 the issue of us discovering oil and, and, and significantly what we're generating and, and what now we say we're going to pipe through the the facilities we have for Ghana's gas. How significantly is that going to improve our energy provision? Or significantly, that is also going to be just a sectional distribution uh, just to augment power? The line is quite strange. Can you please repeat that? OK. We, now, Ghana gas, we're told, is almost ready. And we're also going to have this going to go through the pipelines of the Ghana gas company. Is that going to be significant enough to solve our energy issues? I mean, just to put it in plain language. Uh, well, of course, the, the coming into 
uh, existence of the Ghana gas is uh, going to take a lot of uh, budgetary and financial problems off from the government balance sheet. Uh, it's going to add to our energy sufficiency drive, uh, but that will not be a conclusive uh, evidence of an end to uh, our supply stock in terms of uh, gas requirements for, for the country. What is important for us to realize is that Ghana Gas is bringing on board, uh, you know, a maximum of one train. Uh, that, of course, is not going to be workable because what you gain mm -hmm. from that one train will end up being between 80 and 100. That, of course, can power almost uh, between 600 to 500 megawatts of power drive. Mm. And that can be responsible probably for the increase in the uh, chakra. Mm. Uh, you recollect that our gas supply from Nigeria is supposed to be 120. We never achieved that. We've been running between 50 and 80. And that have been responsible for powering uh, some of the plants we have in, uh, in Tema. Government currently spend almost between 2 to 3 million daily on light for a picking. So if Ghana Gas is going to have that responsibility of, you know, feeding between 500 to, you know, 600 megawatts of power plants. Uh, that will help this country uh, uh, a lot in terms of its finance burdens on the uh, light food world. Uh, but going forward, mm -hmm. uh, the sufficiency in terms of the quantum for this country is not going to be enough. Because by 2017, 2018, our requirement for gas is going to jump between 380 to 400 uh, million standard cubic feet of gas per day. Mm. And if you consider the 120 maximum, which of course is not uh, feasible from Nigeria, but let's assume it's working, mm. and you add about 100 to Ghana, that is 120. So between 2016 and 2015, we expect the other development projects like the Sankofo and the Ten project to come on board. That will add almost about 100. That is not uh, equivalent to between 380 and 400 we'll be looking at. Mm. So there'll be a, a new need to begin to look for other aggressive means of exploration to increase our gas reserves so that the power sufficiency of this country will become very paramount. But what is very important now is the pricing regime for Ghana gas. If we are saying that Ghana gas is coming on board and so that is going to take our problems out, that, not at all. Uh, you realize that even the pricing for Ghana gas is going to be quite uh, a bit more expensive than Nigeria gas. And so if our own gas that we're going to produce is going to be so expensive to take in, of course, what is going to be the relevance in terms of the pricing? People will be expecting their energy bills to come down as a result of the Ghana gas. That will not work. That will not happen because, number one, our tariff regime is built up with a hydro and then largely uh, uh, combined circle turbines. Mm. Hydro is at the lower end, which we expect to be cheaper. And country now, you realize the weaknesses we have as a result of the shortfall from the Akosomo Dam. So that is going to cut a portion of the hydro supply out. The breed dam is in far below 100. So that portion of the breed dam also coming as a hydro is also going to be up. And so gas is now going to drive. If gas is going to drive, the price of gas is, of course, more expensive than that of hydro. So our energy bill in terms of the tariff is not going to reduce at all or going to come down as we need to believe as a result of Ghana gas. What Ghana gas will do is that government persistent spending on light crew to fire uh, those uh, dual plants that are reliable on gas and then uh, 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 light crew, that will be reduced in terms of the light crew. Mm. But going forward, uh, the tariff regime will not change. Well, it's interesting you say that, John Pitambeu, but I, I've been doing the discussions with Kojopoku, and Kojopoku is the director with uh, Gasop Oil, and Gasop Oil, they are into upstream exploration in Ghana's energy uh, sector. As far as we're concerned, uh, could you, it, it, and, and please be on the line, um, 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 John, uh, as far as we're concerned, could you, with what um, um, John seemed to be saying, it means that significantly we need to plan ahead. Yes. You think we're, we're doing that? You, you, no, you, you, like, like, like we've been discussing, we've not been doing that. And he makes a very interesting point, a mm. point that I've been making um, to the ministry for some time now. Um, you see, the, the fact that we are getting gas doesn't necessarily mean that we're getting cheap source of energy, okay? If you are getting gas, as he's saying, the Ghana gas that we are getting is going to be more expensive than the West African gas pipeline. What does it mean in that we're going to have energy security, but the tariffs are not going to come down? It means you're going to have higher um, tariffs. Now, Ghana, or I think this part of the world, is the only place where 
industry pay more than residential. In Europe, it's the reverse. In Europe, residential pay more than industry. For you to drive your industry, industry needs to have cheaper source of energy. Okay? Now, if they don't have that cheaper source of energy, then it means that what we buy is never going to come down because mm. the more tariffs go up, then industries are going to increase their prices. Mm. So it doesn't drive productivity, it doesn't drive consumer goods to come down. Now, if we are saying Ghana gas is coming online and we are all excited about it, but the price of it is going to be higher than, Ghan than the West African gas pipeline, in the long term, what it means is that our, we're not going to see any reliefs in our electricity bill. And that is what we need. You see, most Ghanaians worry about the lights off. But when the lights are on, the next thing we worry about is what? The our, bills. our bills. Because then the more lights we have, the more bills that we, we, we consume. So it's good to have energy security by knowing that we're going to have installed capacity. But very important to the average Ghanaian is that how much am I going to pay for this installed capacity? Most people who are running generators when there's no light can probably afford to pay the higher bills. But we know the, 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 the country we have, even though we say we're a middle-income country, most of the people live below the, the minimum standard wage and can't afford higher mm -hmm. electricity bill. So that is something that we need to plan ahead to know that, okay, if maybe Ghana gas was a rush, okay, how do we now look at uh, other projects that can bring in cheaper energy for the country? Mm. Um, renewable energy for smaller hydro plants, okay? Something the government could do, and I think they should look at it seriously, is tax and import duty waivers for importation and companies who are into energy sector. Mm. Because if I'm paying 25% as, tax, as corporate tax, Okay, that's what everybody pays. And there's no waiver for energy sector. If I'm producing energy, I sh the government should look at giving some waivers in terms of maybe the first eight years whilst we are recovering. If a company puts in a plan to generate uh, electricity, he borrowed the money to put the, the, that in place. So whilst he's paying back the, the cost of the plants, which has been amortized, which has been amortized for a period, then the government should also look at giving some incentives, maybe mm. tax waiver, like mm. you don't pay tax or maybe you pay 5% tax for the first eight years. Mm. Uh, importation, when you import those equipments you need, you don't pay import duty. VAT, maybe you're exempted. Those things will go a long way to help the industry. Okay. Now, John, from what uh, Kujo is saying, uh, then also it brings into the argument what role the IPPs could play, where they get their energy sources from. Because significantly, I've heard you consistently say that they, they seem to be depending on, on the formal sources as far as the gas supplies are concerned. And if you're an IPP, well, you are coming to generate. Where do you get your gas? So how do we streamline all that? Well, so I think it is now clear from the all indication that Ghana gas is not going to be a game changer as we've been made to believe by the excellent president. And to, uh, you know, reduce uh, some of the spending patterns on government, but that will not be a game changer to you and I at the benefit. Now, going forward, uh, the IPPs, where do they get their feet for to, you know, power their generation day? Um, what I think we begin to do now is to look at uh, 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 another way of bringing in uh, uh, gas in terms of uh, liquefied natural gas, which I understand DRA has been working on uh, for some time now. Uh, so we should start thinking of a floating regasification project probably in Accra. That can easily be done if we don't want the terminal to be constructed. We can bring in a floating regasification where the gas will be brought in, you know, in a ship in the form of an LNG and then to regasify through a system and then use the uh, for power processes. It's quite expensive that as a country we should begin to look at that alternative. But you see, in the medium to long term, what we can do now is to create attractive physical regardless in Ghana. You know, the, the, the natural resources are there, they are onshore, they are offshore. We need to create a formidable, you know, physical attractive system to allow the companies to, to operate. You know, what it means is that we need to do intensified exploration. We must create the framework to allow the companies to undertake extensive exploration exercise to make sure that we increase our reserve to productive ratio. That is very important because as a natural resource country that depends so much on your resources for power generation. If you are reducing your reserve to productive ratio and you are not adding up to the reserve capacity, then we will be running into doom. And so we need to put more attention into exploration. That is my view now. Mm. Uh, that's close to Ghana, never, uh, West, West Africa, uh, Ivory Coast, you know, Liberia. You know, the, 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 the nature of rigs that are currently working, the rigs activities are quite high in those areas than Ghana. 
Why is this so? Currently, we have about less than two, three rigs working offshore. Rigs are moving out of this country to other attractive areas because of the fiscal drive. And I think we should look at how policy direction can bring in more exploration activities. There are companies that are willing to do it. We need to create a framework for them. Hmm. And I think when we mature, we can tighten our fiscal regime. Currently, the exploration and production bill before Parliament is a good drive, it's a good motivation. The fiscal terms are quite good. But then to the oil companies, it seems not too attractive. And so when they look at the neighbor and they think that that one is a bit more attractive, of course, rig activities will increase in adjacent uh, basis. So exploration activities must be increased. We must begin to look for other ways of bringing gas through a protein rig application project. And then we must also intensify the drive on uh, renewable resources. Renewable resources are quite expensive in the, uh, you know, in the initial stages, but within, you know, a, a, a framework of fuel within the long term, they become very uh, cheaper as a result of the operational cost. Currently, even if you look at our uh, pricing tariff uh, uh, regime in, in Ghana, you realize that if the feeding tariff program is implemented, if you move above certain limit of consumption, you will be consuming and paying the same rate that a renewable will be paying. Okay, so what it means is that large consumption in terms of industries and residential houses that would go beyond certain consumption, it's proper for them to rely on renewable. I mean, it's cheaper because the operational cost at that time becomes very cheaper. Um, you know, advocating for renewable, no, but not exceed in renewable as government intends to do now. The PAGA renewable, which is of 2 mega, uh, megawatts, I understand what is feeding into the grid was about 1.5 to the machine distribution losses. What will really come down to the uh, supply end will be less than, you know, 1 megawatt. Mm. So we have paid $8 million for 2 megawatts of power. So such a feeding system for renewable to national grid. I don't think Ghana, we are yet there to do that because the conventional system of transmission, distribution, losses, you know, are still there. So for us to undertake a realistic renewable drive, we must begin to think of, you know, uh, embedded generation, which we call, you know, solar panels on our roofs and, you know, areas that we can generate and feed directly to distribution to supply, not to feed into mm. transmission. You know, generation to supply All right. uh, as a means of renewable can also add to our energy intensity. Mm. Well, John, how many more minutes do you have to, to give us? Well, I'm driving. I just parked. Uh, so <laughs> I think I, I'm okay if you can allow me to go. Uh, oh, all right. I all have right. a meeting at 9 o'clock. So all right. All right. Thank you. Fine, I'm okay. okay, thank you very much, John. And John is, uh, is an energy expert, of course. He's a um, uh, director for policy and research, um, Africa Center for Energy Policy. But it's a significant point he makes about what the whole mindset of government and government policy should be about how to attract the oil companies. Of course, there's the added criticism about whether they come to take the country's oil resources, but they come to do the investment. They come to invest the whole technology and the resources, etc. But we should make it very attractive for us if we know that this is what we get at the end of the day. Okay, you see, um, there are two thoughts, okay? There were the thoughts before um, 2001. That thought was that Ghana, we should go it alone and try and do exploration. Time to that change. is what we did before. We even went as far as buying a rig ourselves to try and do exploration. We did all that. We didn't find the oil. Okay. Then there was a thought after 2001, which was, let's make it attractive. Let's give incentives on the ground for companies to be mm. able to come in and look at it. To and say risk, that these are the plans risk, we have. Risk, you know, risk their mm. money. Look, it's risk. Let me give you an example. You can spend $800 million, drill a hole, everything I looks good. Your, your, your seismic looks good. Seismic interpretation looks good. The structure is there, okay? You've done your 3D. You've done your analysis. You've done everything. Geophysicists have done the calculation. You drill a hole to find just water, nothing. $800 million down the drain, nothing. That's the risk. So why should I come to Ghana and risk $800 million? And that is what, in post-2001, that is what the administration got it right. They were able to give enough incentive for companies like Cosmos and Tulo to come and risk that money in Ghana. And be it God giving us a blessing, we did find the oil. Now, I've had, even on this platform, there have been People that have come and argued that ah, they, they, they gave away our oil to companies and all that. No, they did not. They gave an incentive. 
like as you heard the gentleman say, the new regime being tried to be put through in parliament is so unattractive that rigs are now moving out of Ghana. That because is the exploration is companies. The exploration companies, of course. They, because they feel that it's not good ground. Because I mean, it's, what, it's not worth it. My brother, I, I was in Russia, okay, Moscow, having a tit for tat with the Ghana ambassador to Russia, trying to convince the investors to come to Ghana. Once we were sitting there in front of us, you know what they were doing? They were signing visa application to go to Angola. Why are they talking to us? It tells you that Ghana is not that attractive. To get someone to come to Ghana, you need to give that person a little bit more. Mm. Because in terms of the volumes that we find in Ghana, the volumes are not that great. They're not great. They're it, not significant. Exactly. Mm. And in the Gulf of Guinea, right from Liberia, coming all the way it's down, oil. it's oil. It it's depends right. how much the person wants to go. In, in deep waters, look, in Nigeria, you look at Nigeria, it has From a lot Guinea, of oil. Right uh, yeah. They have oil in their shallow waters. But if they go deep shore where Sao Tome is, there's oil. Look, Ghana, if you know about what, how the continental drift is, we have the way they have oil in the other side where the uh, Americans, South Americans have their oil, it's the same way we have our oil. The oil is all the way, all the way down in the basin. So other companies, can go to other areas without the right incentive. And I think the naysayers should allow government to do policies that, allow in, that are investor friendly. Like I said, the tax rebates, okay, um, maybe first eight, six years tax rebate for people investing in IPP, um, importation duty waivers, VAT waivers. Mm. Those are things that will help because that will incentivize, that will, it, that will encourage it, people to come to come, and also it will make the feeding tariff cheaper. Mm. Because if you look at um, the calculation of how much I want to charge for electricity per megawatt, okay, it all depends on my installed costs and my operations. That would um, basically determine how much I want to charge mm. for electricity. Now, if the installed cost mm. does not include taxes then it's bare minimum, so it's cheaper. So I can charge lesser so that the electricity will be cheaper. Like the gentleman said, renewable energy is expensive in the first couple of years. Why? Because it's huge investment that needs to be recouped within eight years, 10 years maximum. So if government can give some sort of waivers, tax waivers, d import duty waivers, um, and that way it would now help the company to recoup its money before in the long run, when he is making more money, then you can tax mm. him higher. Well, Kwejo, this question I'm about to ask you is a bit controversial. It said, are we having all these experiences because perhaps there's no clarity and the mindset of, of the regime, of government, is not clear. No, and, it is. And, and perhaps also they don't have the right expertise and they don't get good advice? No, it's not. You see, it, it is. It, 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 the, the expertise are there. Ministry of Energy, Ghana, GMPC, okay. not much has changed. Mm. I mean, the, only the political, is a political, a political mindset. mindset that has changed. But the civil servants, when you go to the GMPC Petroleum Commission, I know a lot of, I have good friends there. I mean, not any, none of them has left. The technical people are still there. When you go to Ministry of Energy, the technical people are still there. It's not that. What it is is that who is driving the policy? What is the aim of that person driving the policy? Okay, Honorable Boa has good intentions, but if he can only operate within a certain environment. Thank you. You understand. So it, it's it's more about maybe uh, platforms like this that we are expressing opinions that, can that the they can also yes make them like the gentleman that came on the line he would also have said and they i'm sure they are doing good work yeah and they are doing policy research and right. and, so and, 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 and advocacy yeah, so they tend to put a lot more pressure thank you and they can advise the government in a certain direction but in terms of uh, most of our problem is planning okay planning in the sense that um that 5000 installed capacity can we achieve it is planning Okay, do we have enough installed capacity? Do we have enough gas to pipe uh, into? There's a, something that came up. Let me quickly um, say this. There is the thought that after Ghana gas, okay, um, Ghana gas is being fed with the gas from Jubilee, okay? Now, all the other gas is going to come from the 10 projects, which the new wells that are supposed mm. to come online. What people don't know is that that gas from those wells is at the back of a project to be initiated by ENI, the Italian mm -hmm. Oil Exploration mm -hmm. Company. Now, as a government or as a country, we can't be uh, putting words out there 
in the back of other people's um, um, projects. ENI might decide not to do the projects they want to do. So if ENI don't do that project, as, as I speak to you now, the only plan on the ground for those 10 um, wells, the gas to be tapped, is at the back of the ENI project, which to me is not good enough. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, the minister announced, um, or I think two days ago, the two barges that are to be procured. Yesterday. Okay, uh, uh, yesterday. Um, what you should find out is that the, the journalist didn't do the follow-up questions. Okay, the, 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 he mentioned that the contract has been signed and two barges are to come online to be back up. The follow-up questions will be, are these being procured 100% by government? Is the contract signed? Is it an MOU or is it a purchase agreement? Mm. Okay. Who is financing um, these barges? Okay. Where are the funds going to come from? That will give you clarity. That will make you think that, okay, are we just being sold story or are we being sold action? Mm. Okay. Because if it's an MOU, then, um, then it's not going to happen anytime soon. But if it's a purchase agreement signed by the government, when did it go through cabinet? When did it go through parliament? Which one is it? The two... Um, the, the two badges. Which one is it? Um, what do you mean? Which one is it? Um, do we just have an MOU or? No, I don't know. I, I don't know. But what I'm saying, the minister said that agreement has been signed. I have signed. heard that in the news as well. Yes, and that uh, agreement uh, has been signed to procure, um, to put in place two backup badges. And I thought that was also significant because that was also reiterated when the president interacted with the minister. Uh, and when he visited the the gas company and 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 and, and they've been in a, 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 a around the parts of central and right. western region significantly but the point is how do we need to practicalize what the energy needs would be and in what measure do we need to say these are the steps we're taking and these steps concretely concretely are going to give us energy by which date and at which time and by which means right that is only by doing the feasibilities, okay? Feasibility studies by the civil servants at the ministry, and then timeline and shadows. Haven't they been done? I don't, think, I, I think, I don't think most of them have been done. You see, I think we do a lot of policy um, announcements. Then after the policy announcement you has been the done, the intentions. Uh, well, I don't want to call it intention, because if a minister says something, it wouldn't be an intention. It's an intention until, well, uh, it, uh, until it, it, it gets well, effective. It, it, me and you will call it intention, but if my minister sits at the meet me at the press and say that we are going to, to procure... To you, that's a policy direction. It's, it's a policy because he's a minister. And that ministers don't give intentions. Ministers give policies. And that is when it would then be that for the minister to say it, what I would have expected would have been a feasibility study. Okay, Now, with these two barges that are going to be procured, at what cost would they produce electricity? Okay, okay. We have on the line the energy minister, um, Emmanuel Kofibua, and he's also a member of parliament. And uh, a very good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Okay. Thanks, uh, good morning okay. to your listeners. Okay, thank you. My name is Rolando, and thanks for joining me this morning. Now, significantly, you made an announcement of, um, of two badges. Um, that likely could uh, come on stream and significantly help augment supply in the country. Now, as far as the agreements are concerned, uh, do we have it just an intention in the form of MOU or, 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 or we've signed power purchase agreements? And in what form? Yeah, all of those agreements have been concluded. I mean, that is, we've been working on this the last year. In fact, today we are, we are doing the kickoff for the project uh, uh, to start and uh, to start mobilizing it to work on the transmission aspects of that project. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as I said, we had to really make that decision to bring that emergency badge in the face of the challenges we face. And we are uh, uh, the two badges, uh, 225 each, uh, roughly uh, 450 megawatts. Uh, and we believe that uh, it will relieve us and obviously uh, help us to uh, minimize the impact of the possible reduction in the uh, hydro power supply. Very agreement, uh, the power purchase agreement, the PPAs. In, in what form are they? What's the government of Ghana's own contribution to it? Um, is it? Are, are we are we having a hundred percent? I think the agreement is purely. Uh, 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 the uh, company bring Carnetes bringing us, and what we are doing is negotiating and paying for uh, the, the, <laughs> the tariff uh, for for the, the electricity. 
and also guaranteeing that indeed we will pay for the electricity. It is con it's the agreement, as if you look at it, it uh, it's negotiated. The company is responsible for uh, providing the fuel for powering the badge. And all of that, uh, you know, the responsibility is simply for the off-taker, which is uh, the electricity company of Ghana, who is buying the electricity from that company to mm. make sure that they, they can pay for the electricity that they will be supplied to them. Mm. Okay, so what you've said is that it's not owned by governments in any way? Mm, no, the budgets are not, well, are not owned by government. The budgets, uh, but obviously the government has, is going to support ECG to pay for the initial charges that will result in them mobilizing and coming to Ghana. And then in the, the, the tariff will be paid, obviously, by the company producing electricity and then ECG buying that electricity. Mm. And talking about ECG and what the consumer will think, ultimately it means that uh, the cost of uh, the tariffs will still be be up there high. Well, uh, not exactly. I think that uh, surprisingly these budgets, because they use heavy fuel oil and their efficiency, these are these are G uh, <coughs> equipment that are on these budgets. Uh, the tariff is as reasonable as some of the, the plans that we have, and those were all compared. And so they are right within the tariff uh, rates set by PRC. I'm happy to say that the tariffs was also uh, negotiated with PRC, and all of those have been concluded and found to be very reasonable under the circumstances. Mm. Now, uh, uh, as far as trying to create energy is concerned and, and always the think tanks and the energy aspects that we have in our country and their thoughts on renewable energy. What's the government's own policy direction towards it? We know that well, something has been done the renewable in Paga. Energy Act. We passed the Renewable Energy Act and we've been doing a lot of work on renewables. Um, if you recall, we brought in uh, two megawatts solar. And then since the gazetting of the feed-in tariffs that basically guaranteed a discriminatory price for uh, solar wind and others mm. uh, into the grid. There has been an upset in interest in renewables. Um, fact, yesterday I stated that the cumulative uh, provisional licenses, if you put them all together, was well over 2,900 megawatts if you really look at it. But we did a study and we concluded that with the current settings we have, uh, the current capacities in terms of transmission and others, uh, we can accommodate not that amount. And so we are working to make sure that uh, we, we, we gradually get uh, uh, these renewable sources in. Mm. Uh, we are also very realistic about adding a very high number of renewable energy sources, especially because of their current rates. Uh, if you add a very expensive source of energy into your energy mix, you expect to get a higher number in terms of tariff that is high. And so we, we are going to be very uh, strategic. But what we are doing is that we are promoting renewable sources for private individuals, uses, uh, upgrade communities, mm. especially because we believe that if we are going to achieve universal access to electricity, Mm. Those who will not be connected to the national grid must have these solutions. And we are pursuing those strongly. Mm. We talked about adding uh, 150 schools uh, in remote areas and others to have upgrade solutions. Mm. Well, th th that really is significant. But if we have such a policy and then we want to encourage that and would have to feed that into the national grid, uh, particularly looking at the fact that we have significant losses when we do the distribution, then it will, it, we, we, we may see significant losses when we tend to inject them into the grid, don't we think? Well, that's obviously, uh, I think you put it right. But as, as, as I said, uh, we, we are working on it in a way that allow private individuals. And for example, we are working on these two-way meetings. Uh, the guidelines are coming where, for example, individuals, uh, real estate developers who will build houses and put solar panels will have the opportunity to feed into the grid and get credit for it. Mm. We believe that will now encourage a lot of uh, individuals and private real estate developers to have solar panels 
on top of all new houses that are being built. Uh, because there's real advantages in doing that. Okay. Uh, n now that we have a, a lot more IPPs, the independent power producers, uh, the, how many do we have currently, or, and how many are on paper or have applied to to enter into? Well, uh, IPPs, uh, as I said, uh, IPPs are coming, but they are not coming in a way that we we will want them. Uh, and I think that one of the things we are doing is to keep confident that they can really come. If you see what we are doing with the distribution side of, of our system, is to basically give the assurance that look. If you if you put up a power plant and you produce electricity, you can be guaranteed that you'll be paid, and that is the reforms we are working with ECG on. Mm. Well, it, it doesn't it mean that we we need to give them a lot more tax incentives if you have to come in and bring all those equipment? Yeah, there's a lot of incentives, and we are doing that. For example, we are also working to reduce the uh, red tape in terms of the processes leading to signing of a power, a power purchase exactly. agreement and the line system regime, uh, bringing, trying to do what I call a one-stop shop, where allow them to basically do this quickly. Mm. We're working on that. Mm. And, and before we let you go, two more questions, though. Uh, as, uh, w when it comes to the subject of the IPPs, um, where they get the supply of gas, it, it's also going to come from the Ghana Gas Company? Because we know that's yes, significant. Uh, will be. Yesterday, as I said, uh, I told you that the leadership that is being provided by His Excellency President Maham in this area is very critical. Because that is very fundamental to our long-term energy needs. Uh, yes, we are working on the Jimmy uh, gas, which will bring about 120 million cubic feet of gas, targeting roughly over 500 megawatts of power. Uh, but we are more than that, I, I, you had us working on the 10 project. The 10 project is the second FPSO. Second oil production that will bring about eight, uh, <clears throat> another um, 15 million cubic feet of gas. Uh, we are following that up with a third uh, development, which is a Sankofa, which will bring about 170 million cubic feet of gas. The, all of these projects are supposed to come between the 2015 and 2017. Mm. We think that once all of these projects come, we as a country should be sure of about 300 million cubic feet of gas a day for 20 years. Right. That fundamentally changes our uh, situation in terms of cheaper fuel source for our, our thermal plants. And that is exactly what we've been working very hard at. Mm. Well, my last question. As far as we're concerned, we know that the compact uh, were always almost through. Uh, the subject yes. of ECG and w what the management terms should be, has, uh, what's the finality to it? Well, we, we are still working on that. You know, once we sign the compact, we need to now engage stakeholders. And those stakeholder engagements will start. We have to all as a country now decide that whatever the type of models we need, what type of interventions will help make ECG more efficient, allow them to be able to collect revenues using modern technology, keeping everybody honest, and making sure they are responsive to the customer. And so that is the process we'll start. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Emmanuel Amakofi Boa is the Minister of Energy and Petroleum, but he's also the Member of Parliament for Elembele, and Elembele is in the Western Region. Thanks for joining me, uh, Mr. Minister, and uh, that's critical, but w w what he said, which one is politics, and, oh, um, and which one is fact, as far as the realities are concerned? I, I, I know Mr. Boa, uh, Honorable Boa, I don't think he does, when it comes to his work, he does politics. You know, um, what he said, uh, what the, I, I, like I said, are the policies at the ministry, okay. Um, whether it's being followed through, it's a different story. But it's not politics; it's facts. The ten projects will come online. The Sankofa will come online, and the gas will be tapped. But like I said earlier, before the phone call, mm. um, the Jubilee, we have the Ghana gas for Jubilee. The ten project gas from there is not going to be piped to the Ghana gas. There is supposed to be another infrastructure like Ghana Gas to tap the gas from the TAN project and the Sankofa that the minister mentioned. What plans are far advanced? Like I said to you, like I said again, if yesterday he did his meet the press and there had been follow-up questions, a few things that has been clarified now, you asked him, is the barges owned by government? He said no, it's a private venture. What government has done is initiated and enabled that all the necessary red tapes and 
feeding tariffs help that government can give. Government has given the help to make sure the budgets are in place. Mm. So it's not necessarily that government is going to buy budgets. Government has helped to bring the budgets into the country to make sure that they will be operational in terms of being a backup generation. So some of these things could have been asked yesterday and would have been explained. But well, we've asked them today. And, 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 and it's been explained and, today. And significantly, once the assistance from government will be coming through the ECG, it yes. means that they're going to buy and they uh, assist the ECG. No, they're going to gonna buy the, the, the production mm. at ECG a rate, buys the production. Production at a rate that is ECG affordable. Yes. So like I said, it's, it's more about the policy. But then what's the follow-through? Okay, mm -hmm. the follow through being okay, what are the concrete plans? The feasibility, okay, the 10 project, what feasibility is on the ground? What's the feasibility on the ground to make sure that the ENI project, let's say ENI does not do the project, what are the fallbacks? What are the feasibility for the gases from Sankofa? Okay, we also have the Osage for Badge, which I'm told has been given to government now to look at, the, they are looking at the technical viability mm -hmm. of the project since it's been left line, uh, line, for, line some for some time. Mm. Okay, so some of these things, is not about the policy. The policy is good, which is the headline, but then it's the small script, the follow-through, okay? The minister is very energetic. I mean, he wants to see things done, but does he have the team who is working with him, the civil servants? How well are they supporting the minister? Okay, how is the follow-through being taken care of? The feasibilities. Those are some of my concerns. Okay, so that'll be it for the contributions you've made uh, significantly to our discussions this morning. And uh, Kojo Poku, uh, he is an energy expert, but also a, a director for Gas of Oil, the uh, upstream exploration company, and uh, helping us do the discussions this morning. And also joining us on the phone um, have been uh, John Peter Amewu, uh, director for policy and research at the Africa Center for Energy Policy and also the Minister of Energy and Petroleum, Emmanuel Amakofibwa, uh, also joining us on the lines as well. He's also a member of parliament for LM Bele in the Western region. Thanks for joining us, Nick. We're talking poverty and whether as a country we can not significantly reduce those in the doldrums of poverty in that part of the world. To stay on, we have a lot more and the discussions will be up next. <laughs>